All right. Well, again, welcome everyone. We're really excited to have Renee Patrick from Onda here with us. Um, she is the uh, trail coordinator for um, the uh, Oregon Natural Desert Association for the uh, Oregon uh, Desert Trail. And so she's responsible for actually establishing the trail um, and which is super exciting. She's got really a unique experience as a through hiker. And so we're super excited to have her here. Um, she's got well over 12,000 miles under her belt, um, of just walking around, which is awesome. Um, she's got a risk, rich cross section of wilderness teaching skills with her. Um, and she's completed the triple crown of long distance trails in the U S which is the Appalachian trail, the Pacific crest trail and the continental divide trail. And so, um, She's also led trail crews, guided wilderness therapy trips, and taught lightweight backpacking. Um, and so when she's not sleeping on the ground and covering 30 miles a day, like the absolute machine that she is, she can be found pack rafting, skiing, biking, or hiking around Central Oregon. So um, thanks again, Renee, for joining us. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to you. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to get to spread my love of Eastern Oregon and the Oregon Desert Trail to folks who may not be as familiar with it. Um, and thank you to Friends of the Waihi for hosting me. And you may recognize the photo in the background is right out of Leslie Gulch from the water. So the Waihi is just a stunning place, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, but yeah, I've been working actually on the Oregon Desert Trail for seven years now. Actually, December is my seven year anniversary. And I started after finishing the Continental Divide Trail in 2016. So I'm excited to take you along what's happened over the last seven years. To give you an overview, the Oregon Desert Trail is a 750 mile long route that hit some of the highlights of the high desert. And a few of those places are Steens Mountain, the Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge, and of course, the Owyhee Canyonlands. So you may be wondering, why did a conservation organization create a long distance hiking route? Well, really it was to engage the recreation community in conservation issues that are happening through Southeastern Oregon. And the idea was to, to connect places that we've been successful in protecting, like the Steens Mountain Wilderness um, was designated in 2000. The Badlands Wilderness was designated in 2009. So connect those places with our current priorities and places we're trying to protect like the Owyhee Canyonlands. Um, so the mission of the Oregon Natural Desert Association is to protect, defend, and restore these landscapes throughout Southeastern Oregon. And we couldn't do it without help from partners like Friends of the Owyhee, and I'm sure you all are very familiar with the amazing work that they do on behalf of our public lands, stewardship, taking leading hikes, and all sorts of interesting activities. So some of the on the ground work that we do involves stewardship and getting volunteers out. So we do a lot of um, retrofitting of fences or removing fences that might hamper animal migration, we also do wildlife monitoring for species like the greater sage grouse. And we lead a lot of riparian planting trips. So these are for desert creeks and rivers and try to um, help bring back some of the healthy riparian areas. So at the heart of the Oregon Desert Trail project is the belief that once you spend a day, a week, or even six weeks, like I did when I hiked the whole trail, that to know Oregon's high desert is to love it. And so when you spend more time out there and immerse yourself in these places, you'll understand uh, on a deeper level why we're doing this work, why Photo is doing this work, and join us in, in that. And something that I came away with after spending all this time, like I said, six weeks in 2016 when I hiked the entire route, but I've been out many times over the last seven years, it's really an opportunity for us as hikers and recreationists to engage with the landscape on a deeper level and to understand that we are connected to these places and what happens to our public lands affects us and happens to us as well. So I'll give you a timeline of the project. Um, the idea predates uh, my participation. Our former executive director, Brent Fenty, 
had the idea in 2010 to create this route. And like I said, connecting conservation successes and priorities. He's also a long distance hiker, so it doesn't hurt to, you know, imagine and dream up a new long distance trail if you love to walk. So over the next few years, thousands of hours went into inventorying, identifying and inventorying the route, both with staff time and volunteer time. And so when they looked at the Eastern Oregon landscape, they tried to identify existing infrastructure. Where are the trails? Turns out there's really not a lot of trail in Eastern Oregon. So then where are the roads? Turns out there are a lot of primitive dirt roads, two track roads. Some have never been driven on in the last decade. Um, so a lot of these roads cross the desert and it turns out they make really nice hiking paths. Doesn't matter if you can't drive on them. <laughs> They're really great for walking. And then we looked at places to avoid. Are there places for wildlife like near sage grouse lakes that we should avoid? Sensitive cultural areas that we just don't want to bring attention to. So after looking at the landscape through that lens, what came out is a trail that's not quite a trail. I like to call it a virtual route. So of the 750 miles, we have 9% trail. 50, or I'm sorry, 35% is cross-country travel and 56% are roads. And like I said, those are primarily dirt roads and a little bit of pavement when you're walking in and out of towns. Um, and there are no trail markers out there. So when we say route, we mean it's a, it's a collection of these different surfaces. And um, what that means is experienced backcountry adventurers um, are really best suited to hike the entire thing. But don't worry, if you don't have all those skills, we have plenty of sections that you can do that are on trail where the navigation isn't as challenging. And we really wanna help people develop their skills. So as I'll, I'll explain later, we've developed a skills progression and a skills rating. So you can easily see um, and evaluate sections that you are capable of doing now and maybe sections you want to aspire to do and how to get that experience. So going back to our timeline, um, in 2013, we had our first hiker complete the trail. Sage Clegg hiked it and biked some of it. And with her um, information and feedback, Onda released the first set of materials to the public. That was a map set and a guidebook in 2014. And that first year, three people completed um, the entire route. And then the next year, one hiker completed the route. I really like to talk about this hiker. His trail name is Huck Finn because he did the entire trail with just a map and compass. So he did not take a GPS device. He found the maps and the resources to be um, sufficient enough to, to help him find where he needs needed to be, help him get the water and help him get from one end to the other. So he has a great YouTube video um, up on online uh, 2015 with Huck Finn. So in 2016, um, that's when I, uh, right after I had started the trail, I was one of the five hikers, was the 10th person to complete the entire route. And after, after hiking, I um, created a couple new resources, which I'll touch on in a few minutes. But I want to take you into, into an in-depth look at what at my hike that year. And I did it in five different sections. So I didn't do it as a through hike. And as you'll see, or you already know about Southeastern Oregon, um, the the weather, the desert is the boss. So you have to do what um, you know, the weather permits, the terrain permits. And so for me, it seemed like most the best way for success would be to hike it in sections. Um, so you'll see on the maps that I show, the blue line is the Oregon Desert Trail. It was originally put together. And then there will be colored lines. And these are alternates that I hiked, um, sort of scouted and hiked and are now available to people um, on their journey. So you have options. I like to say it's a choose your own adventure type of trail. And the reason for some of these alternates are to solve some problems that hikers were having. So here you'll see there's some red line down by McDermott. Um, the original route went nine miles north of McDermott, 
um, people would pop out on Highway 95, which is a busy highway, and really have trouble getting into town, whether walking the highway or trying to get a ride or a shuttle. It was just, it was complicated and people weren't getting picked up. So I created a route so you could just walk through town because you're going to want that burger and that milkshake and that shower. So on this particular trip, I started in late May. On this section, I hiked 255 miles. So I started at Anderson Crossing, which is near the headwaters of the Oahe, and I hiked west back towards Bend. Um, I hiked through the town of McDermott and then up into the Oregon Canyon Mountains, uh, through the Trout Creek Mountains, down through Denio, and then through the Pueblo Mountains. By the time I got to fields, I had a ton of blisters. My feet looked like hamburgers and I was just not enjoying myself. Uh, when I looked at the terrain ahead, I had a 5,000 foot climb from the Elvor Desert up into the Steens. And I decided I'm gonna hike smarter and not harder and come back to this section another time. So I found a ride around to French Glen and I continued hiking west. So from French Glen, you head straight towards the Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge, and you traverse the whole refuge from north to south. And then I ended this particular hike in the town of Plush. Um, so when I started late May, I was surprised and delighted to find there was still a good amount of snow and water. There was This is Laos Canyon. Um, it was very lush um, and beautiful. This was my first night on the trail. This is part of the McDermott alternate and I'm overlooking the McDermott Valley and into Nevada. It was simply a stunning first campsite and I thought it bode, it boded, that's not the right word. It, it was a good sign for what I had to come. Um, now I did encounter some storms as most people will throughout the year, it can, you can, have very intense storms. This particular storm, I'm gonna head back. You'll see my shelter is a tarp that I set up with a metal hiking pole in the center. Well, when the lightning started striking and there were no trees around, I dropped the hiking pole and I just sort of hunkered down underneath my tarp. Um, when most of the lightning had passed, I peeked out to see the most amazing sunset, um, just the colors reflected under the clouds and it just, really struck home that you will have your hardest moments, your scariest moments next year, just delightful moments and just the beauty um, and the juxtaposition of those challenges and those wonderful times was, was really impactful. Um, so in July, I went back. And so I went back to Anderson Crossing and I have been pack rafting low volume desert rivers for about a decade now. And so I wanted to see if I could pack raft the Owyhee in the middle of summer. So as many of you know, there's very little water in the Owyhee, but I thought with a lightweight inflatable boat, maybe I can just pick it up and walk. But I went into this two week journey, not knowing would I be walking the whole way? So it was really, um, a sense of adventure and discovery. So the little yellow line you'll see down at the bottom was a short little alternate I took to drop in at a place called Flag Crossing on West Little Owyhee. And that's because the first 13 or so miles from Anderson Crossing to Flag Crossing, very narrow, choked um, slot canyon, lots of rocks and, and barriers. So I thought I'll give myself a little bit easier time. So I dropped in and hiked some, pack rafted a little bit, but primarily I was on my feet until the light blue line, which is five bar. And from there, I was able to paddle the entire rest of the way all the way to Lake Owyhee State Park. So this is a picture of my gear. I spent a lot of time on preparation because I was not only carrying all my backpacking gear, but all my boating gear. And because this was a solo trip, I spent a lot of time thinking about safety. I wanted to keep myself safe. I carried a satellite beacon so I could communicate daily um, with my partner at home and with Anda. So not something to be taken lightly. An adventure like this is incredibly um, challenging just for the remoteness of it. 
but like I said, I'd had a lot of experience with low volume desert rivers, so I thought I was up to the challenge. This is some of what I encountered in West Little Owyhee. So it is a very narrow canyon, and there were times on the photo on the left where I would get to deep pools. So people who go through without boats will have to swim any time of year, you have to swim. Um, but then I would encounter, I might, I blew up my boat, I might paddle for 50 or 100 yards and then get to a gravel bar. So then I'd have to pick up my boat, walk across the gravel, push my way through willows. But then there were times like the picture on the right, where it was choked with boulders, and I had to very carefully step and pick my way through. And sometimes I found, well, this, this route doesn't go, and I had to backtrack and find another way through. And there were times when I had to lower my boat down and down climb um, just because of the, the difficult nature of this, this very wild slot canyon called West Little Waihee. But it was so amazing. It was really stunning, but it was very slow going. So this particular day, I spent 13 hours traveling and only went seven miles. So it was very, very... Um, just exhausting and I had the mantra one step at a time because I had to be very focused on each move to make sure I could keep myself safe. But then I saw current. So I got to five bar and saw that there was movement in the water. It wasn't a still lake and I thought well if the water can move so can I. So I inflated my boat and started paddling. But then I got to some of the big rapids. So many of you who know the terrain or the river between Three Forks and Rome know there's some big rapids. So this is Widowmaker. Um, and come to find out when I launched the CFS, the water level was 135. So that's very, very little water. And so normally all of these rocks would be underwater. And this is a very difficult rapid, a class five. Um, but I had to pick my way through the boulders. Um, there was just not enough water to even go through some of them. And it took me about an hour and a half to get through this rapid um, walking around. Uh, for the, those of you out there that aren't familiar with pack rafts, this is a lightweight inflatable boat that looks much like a kayak. The back of my boat has a dry suit zipper, so I'm able to store all of my overnight gear in dry bags, long dry bags, that then fit in each of the side tubes of the boat. And then I take a sill nylon bag and I scoop air in and push it into the boat and inflate it. And then I have a, a bag up up front on my bow for things like snacks and, and water, things I'll need to access during the day. So it's a really smart design. Um, we, I did put in some thigh straps so it can be paddled through white water and because of the extra weight in the boat it actually punches through the rapids really well and it's fairly stable. In all honesty this is what my time in the Owyhee was like most of the time. I laid back and watched the amazing canyon float by. Um, it was just gentle. It was also very hot so I went swimming a lot. Um, but it was a fabulous way to see the canyon. The hiking route does hike along the rim a lot of the ways. There's a few places, places where it does come down and touch the water, but primarily you're up a thousand feet above it walking on the canyon rim. So um, getting to experience it on the water was fabulous. So this is the eastern terminus of the Oregon Desert Trail at Lake Owyhee State Park. That little rock jetty by Indian Springs Campground is the official end. So I came and paddled around and finished this particular leg of, of my trip. So in September, I returned to Plush and hiked back towards Bend. So this was a section of 275 miles. And so I took a couple alternates here, again, primarily to get hikers to town because as many of you know, if you spend a few days out there, you are just starving and you want to shower. So that's one of the most important things to get people to the services they need. So the yellow line is an alternate I created into the town of Lakeview, the green line into Christmas Valley. And you'll see there's a tiny little gap near Bend due to timing. I need to skip a short section there, but don't worry, I came back to hike it later. So starting in Plush, um, 
this was also a fall hike. So water is always an issue out in the desert, but particularly in the fall because um, water levels are lower. Um, this picture is not lemonade. <laughs> this is water from this lake. And so I have a water strategy that I use and I would encourage other people to use. I first filter the water through a bandana to get the chunks out. And then I'll filter it through a filter. Um, if it still looks suspect, I'll add some chemical treatment, and then I might add the lemonade. So it's really important to think through your water strategy and plan around water very carefully. And the other tip is bring a way to clean your filter. One pass of this water through a filter could clog it, and you'll need to clean it out sometimes between every use. So that is a necessity, is a way to clean that filter. But there are amazing things to see. The lands that the Oregon Desert Trail passes through have been um, tribal and indigenous lands since time immemorial. The Northern Paiute have long lived, traveled, hunted these places. And there's lots of traces of, of those, those journeys and those stories. Um, so you'll, I encountered things that I expected to see and things I didn't expect to see. These are some of the petroglyphs I saw. And then the trail goes on the edge of Abert Rim. So this is one of the largest vault block mountains in the country. It towers 2,500 feet above the valley below. And it's just a stunning view of the basin and range landscape. So you can look down and you can see the, the ground lifting and then going into basin. And it's just such an incredible place. And this is an example of a cross country section. So you won't find trail up here, but you're walking on the edge of a cliff. So it's pretty clear where to go. So not all of the cross country sections are extremely challenging. Then I tied into a, a national recreation trail called the Fremont National Recreation Trail that goes through the Warner Mountains. And so we tie into this existing trail system and it's a wonderful transition zone between the forests and the desert. So here you'll get trees, which means shade, which is in short supply on the desert, shade, water, single track, you won't need to spend a lot of time worrying about navigation. So if you're looking for an, an easy section to start with, I highly recommend the Fremont section, which is section seven in our trail materials. So the alternate I took into Lakeview goes into town by the Noni trail system, and it pops you right into the middle of town. So you have a safe way, you have multiple restaurants, multiple hotels. So this is the biggest community we have outside of Ontario and Bend, and there's a gear shop. So there's really great um, resources for folks to, to have once they get to town. So this is looking back at Abert Rim from the other side, from the Fremont National Recreation Trail. So I just love being able to see where I've been, where I'm going, and it is absolutely stunning to see. I was just up on top of that just a couple days ago. I really love this trail. There are amazing views, and I highly recommend everyone go check it out. It has um, had a few fires come through recently, but as of this fall, everything is open. Hopefully, cross your fingers, <laughs> we'll have a, uh, a smaller fire year next year. So after I pass through the town of Paisley, uh, the route goes through um, on the eastern side of Summer Lake up on Diablo Rim. So it was late September by this time, and there's very little water, almost no water in this section between Paisley and Bend. But because of the overcast skies and the cooler weather, that made hiking through it easier and I needed to carry less water. I also carried leftover pizza. So this is one of my favorite things to do on a trail is when I go to town, order a large pizza, pizza and pack out the rest. So I went to Pioneer Saloon, if some of you know it, in Paisley um, and had an amazing uh, snack for the next day. Uh, and this is Diablo Rim. So just under my knee where I'm jumping is Diablo Peak, which is a pyramid shaped peak, which the Oregon Desert Trail goes up and over. But essentially this is a rim that you will walk along. It's about a thousand feet above the valley below. And so for 
like in the winter rim or on the left below. So I was hiking this day along the rim heading north and I had seen a lot of pronghorn. So I saw this big herd of animals, what I thought were pronghorn, but they ran right off the side of the cliff. And I thought, no way, what, what just happened? So I, I got to the edge and I peered over and I saw a large herd of bighorn sheep. So it was such an unexpected encounter and really amazing to see out there. There are just so many surprises and delights um, out in the desert. So the alternate that I made through the town of Christmas Valley, I connected into a short little trail through crack in the ground. And this is a deep fissure that cracked open and there's a trail in the bottom so you can walk along the top or through the bottom. So it's a fun little um, section of trail you can hit on the Christmas Valley alternate. So then I made my way to the Badlands Wilderness and there are some amazing ancient juniper trees and interesting lava rock formations. And as I said at the beginning, there, is, there are no signs. So I had to bring my own sticker on my coffee cup to indicate that I had gotten to the western terminus of the Oregon Desert Trail. And this is the Tumulus Trailhead, which is in the Badlands Wilderness. So in October, I went and hiked those 13 miles that I had to miss because of timing issues. And then in November, I finished the hike by going back to the scenes and hiking. And this time, instead of um, east to west, I hiked west to east. Um, again, it, there's no rules. Hike, the, hike however it best suits you. So I wanted to go down the 5,000 feet to the Elver Desert instead of up. But I was also doing this pretty late in the season. So there were some challenges. Um, I left French Glen on Halloween. And by the time I got up to the top, um, not on that the previous day, but it had already snowed. And this picture, I think, is a really good illustration of why you need to pay attention and adjust your plans according to what is happening in the weather, in the terrain. There were about three inches of rime ice on the sign. And it just goes to show, like, you really do not want to be up there when it's storming. Um, enough to leave traces of ice like that. Um, you need to make good decisions. And that's what I tell hikers, your best chance of success is being adaptable, paying attention, and um, being willing to change your plans. If today is not the day to go up to the top of Seams Mountain, you wait it out. So I had gotten up there midday and the snow had softened enough for me to kick some steps in. Um, this is a very steep section of trail down to Wild Horse Lake, but it was simply stunning with a little bit of snow covering everything. And it really highlighted all the layers of rock and the rim rock. Um, so I really enjoyed this day going down, 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 down to the Elbor Desert. Um, so this was the next day looking back at where I had come. And so that that day I had, I had camped in Beginning Gorge, summited Steens and went down. And by that night I was soaking in Albert Hot Springs. So I camped, uh, the trail goes right by Albert Hot Springs. So that's one of the great places you can stop and soak if you um, need that after a long day. So from here, the route goes south through Elbor Desert and it's next to Elbor Lake and by the Borax Hot Springs. So these are hot springs that aren't suitable for soaking. Um, the temperatures are simply too hot um, and unreliable to be safe. But there are some um, sensitive species, that El the Borax Chub, that live in this area. And it's really interesting. There's lots of these little pockets of hot springs and it's a fascinating place to walk through. And that was my trip. So that was the fifth leg of my section hike in 2016. Um, so it was a fabulous trip um, full of adventure. And so I came back to the office and I thought, okay, I have lots of ideas for new resources to create. So again, that year worked on five new trail resources. And then in the time from 2016 to now, a lot of my time has been spent on um, helping hikers, again, refining the resources, working with our land management agencies, leading trail work. I've read a, led a lot of trail work in the scenes. I've led hikes, I've led hikes for Friends of the Owyhee, 
in other groups. So it's really helping people figure out how to get out there, how to be safe, and how to enjoy their time. So if you're not convinced yet, let me tell you a few more reasons why you might want to hike on the Oregon Desert Trail. Solitude. So those of you that are avid backpackers, you'll know that popular trails like the Pacific Crest Trail are just teeming with people. It is so popular that it's hard to find true solitude out on a backpacking trail. You can find that here. And in fact, I like to say you will see more pronghorn than people in the desert. And I'm pretty sure all, all of us that have hiked it will agree we saw more pronghorn than people. Next, the night sky. Um, as you may know, or maybe you don't know, southeastern Oregon is the biggest patch of dark night sky left in the entire country. So this is an amazing place to see the, the stars and the Milky Way, um, and it's a treasure. It's something to really, really protect is the quality of our dark night skies. Hot springs. So I already mentioned Elbert Hot Springs, but there are other hot springs you walk by. You'll uh, several in the Oahe. There are um, the Heart Mountain Hot Springs. There's Hunter Hot Springs near Lakeview. Summer Lake Hot Springs near Paisley. And really, I think there's nothing better after a long day than soaking your sore muscles in some hot springs. We have wildlife. So a lot of the trail goes through places on the Pacific Flyway. So we have thousands of birds that come through every year and hit places like the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge or Warner Lakes on their journeys um, across, across the world. Um, there's, like I've already mentioned, the pronghorn. You'll see other species, um, lots of different kinds of wildlife. And really, you know, the pronghorn is their mascot, so I'm a little partial to them. And then history. I've mentioned before there are traces of of people, of humans all over. So humans have lived in, in Oregon's desert since time immemorial. And in fact, uh, the route goes near Paisley Caves, which has the oldest definitively dated presence, um, traces of human history in, in the United States, in North America. So there are lots of things, and I really encourage people to learn more about um, some of this. And also there are tribe, tribal members and tribes still living, working, recreating, enjoying lands today. So the, there's the Burns Paiute tribe near Burns, the Warm Springs tribe. A lot of folks um, have spent time out in the desert and live there. And then there's the Fort McDermott tribe down by McDermott. The cool geology. So I've already mentioned Abert Rim, one of the largest fault black mountains, but we also have Steens Mountain, which is considered one 50 mile long mountain. We also have the Oregon Badlands Wilderness. So these lava flows are traces of an old shield volcano. And so these fingers of lava go all through the Badlands and have cracked open and you can go explore in between the cracks, climb on the rocks. So it's a really fun thing to do. Finally, freedom. Um, because this is all on public lands, mostly public lands, and once you can look at a, at a map, read the topo lines and understand, oh, that looks like a really interesting feature in the landscape. I want to go there, or I want to take the shortest way to town because I really want some ice cream. Like, you can make the route your own. You can make your own alternates. Um, and I think all of us who have hiked it have gone slightly different ways in different areas based on our curiosity. So there are challenges as well. So the remoteness. So knowing when you're going into this experience that you are an incredibly remote area and so to be prepared, leave your travel plans with people, um, look at where if you needed to get medical help where would you go you know really spend some time thinking about what this remoteness offers in, for, in terms of challenges so there's water it's not only the quality or the availability of the water that you'll encounter out there but it's the quality i don't recommend drinking from dirt cow tanks like this. Um, so through the resources we offer, you can plan your water strategy so you won't have to drink this.
water caching. So there's definitely places you will want to go out ahead of time and place water for yourself. So this was a cache I left for myself when I was going up Diablo Rim. I left three gallons. Um, fortunately, because it was overcast, I ended up dumping out one of the gallons. Um, but it's a lot of weight. So being prepared for those extra 20 pounds of water you might have to carry. Navigation. So having good skills and knowing how to use your GPS and your map and compass before you get out there. Um, but like I said, there's ways that you can get experience with navigation. Um, but it's good to practice, practice, practice before you head out there. And weather. The weather can be challenging any time of the year, so just be prepared. It can rain, it can snow, um, it can have lightning storms all times of the year, so being prepared for that. And it's a high desert, so the Steve's Mountain is almost 10,000 feet, so you will have snow through definitely into July many years. In fact, I heard yesterday there's about five feet of snow already on top, so know that you will encounter some snow, and that it is a high desert. It's cold more often than it is hot in this part of Oregon. But we have trail resources to help you figure out where to go, how to go, and keep yourself safe. So we have maps. So each, all of our 750 miles are broken down into 25 different sections, and each section is between 20 and 40 miles. So on any one map, you'll see waypoints. You'll see the distance between the waypoints. You'll see the type of tread or terrain you're walking. You have helpful hints. You have water data. So the water is rated reliable, questionable, and unreliable. And I've put on um, land designations so that when you're walking, you'll understand, oh, I'm on the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge right now. Or now I'm in the Blitzen River Wilderness Study Area. And what do those mean? So we also define some of those land designations for you. So you have a better understanding of the place that you're in. The first part of our guidebook really covers what to know before you go. So we talk a lot about what to expect when we say cross country or when we talk about water. And then there's information about driving in the desert, leave no trace, and then some other references that you can, resources that you can reference. Um, we have an uh, intense, extensive public lands uh, section, so you can learn about the public lands. Everything is color coded, and all the agencies who manage the lands are listed, so you can contact them if you'd like further information. And then we have conservation actions. So if you want to do something and contribute while you're on your hike or after your hike, we have a list of things that you can do to engage uh, with the conservation issues or just to deepen your understanding. And then the second part of the guidebook is really the, the nitty gritty. These are pages that you will want to print out and take with you on the trail. So we have a section overview map of how everything relates in those individual maps, gives you a big overview. And then the narrative is really a waypoint by waypoint narrative of what you will experience out there. And then we start to define those um, land designations, like here, the Oregon Badlands Wilderness. And then we have flora and fauna and other interesting information to help you understand the place that you're in. So the water chart, this is, I think is one of the most important resources. This is a Google Sheet that you can access online and on your phone. Even while you don't have cell phone service, you can um, access it offline. But this is a, a really good planning tool to figure out the distances between water. So between those reliable, between those questionable. And then there's a place for you, for the public, to add their observations. So if you visited a water source, you can put in the date. Was it dry? Was it flowing? The quality. So over time, we have a really good picture of all the water that's out there and people can really make educated um, decisions about how much water to take between sections. I talked about water caching, so we've developed water cache guidelines with the Bureau of Land Management, and we have suggested water cache locations. 
Um, and then we have data. We have waypoints and tracks that you can upload onto your device. I like to use Gaia GPS when I'm out hiking, or it's even great to upload to something like Google Maps and you can, or Google Earth, you can zoom in and see the route in incredible detail. This is something nice to do before you head out. So you get kind of a vision or you can learn to expect where you're gonna see out there. Then I have a town guide. So I've created a guide so you and map so you know when you get to Paisley or when you get to Lakeview, where are the hotels, where are the restaurants, who I have individual people listed, trail angels, as some people call them, people who will help out. So I have all the services you'll need to know um, in each of the communities. And then there are trail registers. We have an online trail register. I know people have found hiking partners this way by signing our online trail register. And then we have physical registers in some of the businesses along the way. So if you want to leave notes for someone, you know, there's someone behind or even, um, you know, maybe someone who's living in the community wants to say, hey, you know, hit me up if you want to shower. So it's a good way to communicate both with the trail community and with each other. So a few things I've added to the guidebook in the last few years, a skills progression, a skills rating. So each section now has a rating on water availability, navigation and terrain, and then multi-sport information. So for equestrians, bikers, paddlers, skiers, where can you go? Um, this is a glimpse of the skills rating. So I've used this the ski um, symbols. So everything is rated from, you know, your moderate green circle to your double black diamond. And we have a skills progression so you can get ideas of how to, um, how to get out there if you want to hike the whole thing or some of the more challenging sections. So then on the right shows each section um, breaks down the, the multi-sport options. Um, and then the terrain, the navigation, the water availability, they're each rated and has some information about why we rated it that way. So for equestrians, Steens Mountain is a great place to ride. A lot of equestrians love to go out in Little Blitz and Gorge or Ringanine Gorge. For paddlers, the Owyhee, obviously. Um, so popular with rafters and kayakers. And um, this is another river, the Shewakin River out of Paisley. I wanted to see if I could pack raft it. So I timed it when there was enough water in winter one year. So um, yeah, lots to try out and discover. And then biking. So all those dirt roads that cross the desert, especially between the mountain ranges, would be great on a bike. And then skiing. So we have the established ski area of Warner Ski Area by Lakeview. And then if there's enough snow every, uh, on a winter, you could practically ski tour the whole thing. This is Steens Mountain. They have a winter permit system so you can access the high, the high terrain. Um, so lots of options. If you want ideas for day hikes, I have on our website um, posts for 21 different day hikes along the trail. We have multi-day loop hikes along the trail and then more suggestions for multi-sport adventures. So like I said, you don't have to do all 750 miles. In fact, far more people go out for day hikes or a long weekend than ever through hike. And I think um, that is probably the case for most long distance trails. You hear about the through hikers, but it's really the day hikers and the, the week long hikers that head out there the most. So what's the future of the Oregon Desert Trail? Well, really we wanna do what's best for the habitat. So because it's not one defined route, it's not a, a one trail the whole way, we can be responsive to what's happening on the ground. We want healthy ecosystems and good habitat to be more important than this trail, than this route, so we can be adaptable um, and do what's best for these lands. How can you help? Well, you can get out there. You can hike it, get dirty, and tell me about it. I love to hear about your adventures or if you have feedback, you know, because um, every, every, uh, alternate adds more color to the to the adventure um, i'd love to hear what you think 
You can keep track of water sources. So using that water chart that I explained, you can document when you saw water, where you saw water, the quality of that water that will really help the long-term success of hikers out there. You can go to town, you can drink a beer and eat some nachos and tell your stories. I think there's there's been some great um, conversations that have come out of a dirty, smelly hiker sitting down at the bar and someone's curious and, and you know, and they start talking. So you never know um, what kind of interaction you can have. So um, yeah, just, I think you'll have fabulous stories to share with people and I know they love to hear them. You can get involved with Friends of the Owyhee, which I'm sure some of you already are, but they lead great stewardship opportunities, hikes. Um, there's a long list of events that they put together. It's a really fabulous organization. So if you haven't yet gone out on an outing, I highly suggest um, you connect and, and really experience the Owyhee firsthand. So that is my presentation tonight. I do want to tell you all of our trail resources are free and they're available on our website. They're mostly PDF downloads. Um, and I always love, you know, helping people out or answering questions. You're welcome to drop me a line or ask a question. Um, but I think we have some time tonight for questions. So I will um, stop sharing my screen and come back to the group if there are any questions out there. All right. Thank right. you so much, Renee. That was so interesting. It was so cool to hear about your trip or various okay. trips, actually. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, go ahead and come off mute and just speak up. Great. Does anybody have a question or, or if not, um, one thing that you uh, touched on that I think is really important and that's keeping our public lands open to the public. And one way to do that is to let the people in these towns know that we, the people enjoying the outdoors are bringing money into those towns and to let them know that keeping these resources open is important. That's a really good point. And I think, um, especially as hikers, we have a unique um, experience in these small communities, because I will tell you, when I got to fields, I spent 24 hours there. I ate probably like five different meals. I stayed in the, in the hotel. I probably talked to everyone that came through because we don't have a car and we're there and we want to, you know, eat, get as many calories as we can, we really do make a difference in, in spending the money and also interacting with people. Um, because, because I do a lot of my hiking solo, I'm also kind of, I'm starved for human interaction. So I want to have conversations with people. So I think it's a really great opportunity to sort of, yeah, share with with those you encounter why you're out there what you love about it um and i think that can be very impactful hi Renee. Uh, i'm out of boise and i am curious uh, to see what your point of view is about starting those initial steps to decide is a section hike or a through hike or multiple section hikes um, on the odt something that i want to do in my case i mostly finished the arizona trail this past spring but had to get off in flagstaff due to a foot injury um so with the little with that level of experience for a long distance hiker uh, what are your thoughts on how to prepare and kind of decide if this is something you truly do want to do? Because it's a beautiful country out there and trail. Yeah, well, the Arizona Trail is great preparation in itself. That's an amazing desert landscape as well. Um, but I think if you're looking at, you said either a through hike or a section hike is, um, I would try try a section. You know, uh, one of the hikes I led for a photo a couple years ago was section 25 between Lake Owyhee State Park and Leslie Gulch. So it's just, it's 26 miles. 
there it's it's a significant amount of cross-country hiking but there's some really good landmarks some guardrails some handrails there is some water there is some road access actually tim met us a few times on the trail or on the route so that would be a fabulous section and one of the most scenic and beautiful to just try and maybe um yeah for a long weekend or um a day I, you know some people like to do high mile days but i would just do a little section and see if you like that then maybe keep going <laughs> how about that area from three forks north and and just kind of around three forks in general yeah so there the route goes um high above the rim so you are walking on a lot of um, roads but you can also walk cross country right along the rim so the navigation is not challenging a uh, water access can be challenging but you also have the road um into three forks you could cache some water for yourself um, if you if you wanted to, I do have a couple alternates. You could go down Indian Creek or um, Soldier Creek, I think it is. So you could make your way down to the Owyhee to get water, and that could be a fun little side trip and camp along the river. Um, but yeah, I think the world is your oyster. If you can look at the maps and see, well, how can I make this fit for what I want to do in my comfort level? Thank you. I see Susanna, did you have a question? Susanna, make sure you're off mute. We can't hear you. I saw another hand earlier from Carrie. Carrie, did you have a question? Yeah, hi Renee. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, what is your favorite part of the Owyhee? Do you have a favorite part? It's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I really love Leslie Gulch, this really section 25 that I was just explaining. Um, it takes a long time to drive around. So that's something we learned to get from Leslie Gulch to Lake Hawaii State Park. It may be only 25 miles or 26 miles hiking, but it's like a three hour car drive to get around. But um, it's absolutely stunning. It goes through um, the Honeycombs area, which has fascinating rock formations. When we did the hike with Photo, we had a BLM geologist with us and she was pointing out all sorts of features and found a geode. So she she cut open a geode and we all took little pieces of this geode home. So it's really, really fascinating place. Thank you. All right, Susanna, go ahead if you come off mute and then go ahead. Just tap the little microphone icon. <laughs> All right, well, maybe not. All right, any other questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead, Robert. So I have another question. Um, the online resources, that you, when were those most recently updated? I think I downloaded them about three, maybe even four years ago or something like that. Yeah, I've had some updates since then. Um, the most recent I did this fall, actually the the BLM um, has changed some names. So there were some derogatory names of some features along the Oregon Desert Trail. So I went through and made sure to, to change all the names. So there's tiny little tweaks here and there, but definitely um, there have been some, some bigger, the route itself hasn't changed, but I've added things. I think mostly in the way of some of those um, 
skills ratings. Um, so you, it's still you'll still be able to hike with what you've downloaded, but there might be a little bit more information in the new resources. Oh, OK, thank you. Susanna, hi. Hi, I'm sorry, I was blocked and I had to leave the meeting to fix the settings. But anyway, sorry for the hassle. Um, my question for you, Renee, is, um, is there any chance that your guidebook will come out in a hard copy? <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have plans to at this time. I definitely have heard that people would like that. So um, I'm not going to say it won't happen. Um, I'm not working on it currently. But uh, what I suggest people do if they want to print a copy is to send it to a print shop in town or even like a Kinko's if you don't want to have it at home or even your library. Although I forget how many pages it is now and it is color. So it'll cost you a little bit, but probably cheaper than if we sold you printed copies. <laughs> oh, thanks, that helps. Yeah. Yeah, go I see ahead. a couple more hands. Yeah, I think Richard's up. Go for it. I have a logistics question. When you're going to do a section of the trail and you drive to the start of that section, and you want to get you hike the section how do you then get back to your vehicle yeah so there's a number of ways people do that um you i've heard of people so if you can find a buddy or a friend you will each park on either side of the section and hike back and swap keys in the middle um when i've done sections i I hitchhike. So hitchhiking is something that a lot of hikers do on long distance, more established trails. Um, it did take me a while in some places, but we also have trail angels in a lot of the communities. And so I know some of those folks have helped people find rides and there is some public transportation. So there's a bus service that runs between Bend and Vail in Ontario. And then there is um, a senior service bus in um, out of Christmas Valley that hits Lakeview and they go to Bend sometimes. So there are options out there, um, but I like to use my thumb. <laughs> Patricia, did you have a question? Yeah, can you just comment about the mix of um public and private land and are there any requirements as you're heading out into certain areas and i mean to me I, i'm here in portland and i have only dabbled a little bit in that area but just to me there's a lot of open range land and i'm just wondering yeah just to, if just describe that a little bit yeah, so the route is all on public or public rights of way. So some of those roads you're walking are county roads. Um, and I've met, I've made it a point to meet with all of the private landowners or most of them uh, that you'll encounter. So even if you're on public, you may be walking next to a fence line that is private. But it's good to know that not all fences mean private and not all private is fenced. So on the maps, I clearly mark the private land, um, but some people have come forward and there's one particular family between Hurt Mountain and French Glen who is letting, given permission for hikers to pass through access water on their land. Um, and so others have offered help, but um, generally folks are aware of the trail now. It's been around long enough. They, they're used to seeing hikers. Um, and I haven't actually heard of any negative encounters, but again, it's your responsibility to know that you are on public. And so another resource I recommend using, if you like to use your device, um, on Gaia GPS, they have a private land layer. So when you're using your, your map on your phone, you can see when you're on public and when you're on private. Onyx is another um, GPS app that also shows private land. So between all of these um, resources, you can definitely um, make sure you are where you want to be. Mary, you had a question? 
Yeah, hi. Yeah. Hey. Um, we're thinking of trying to do a through hike of it this in this spring, and I um, we have I think we have adequate skills and background, but I'm just wondering with the conditions how feasible it is to do that all. You know, considering the snow and the steams and the heat of the summer and everything, how feasible does that seem to do this all at one stretch? Um, definitely people have been successful and it really depends on the year. So we had a very dry start to the winter this year. And so people, you know, were contacting me in February and March when there was almost no snow on the ground. I said, this might be a great year to start a little bit early. But then people came out in April and it started snowing in May and it was snowing in June. And it was just incredible high snow levels in in the steams. So again, that I think that comes down to making decisions. Like you can plan, you can start. I like that the best um, window to start is really mid May. But depending how long you're hiking, you can get in some hotter temperatures in mid to late June. But then June two years ago, we had 120 degree weather. So it's really hard. You have to sort of make decisions uh, as you go if it's really you know conditions aren't appropriate um, you may have to wait and come back and finish another time but there have definitely been people who have completed it in the spring that's your a good weather window usually <laughs> yeah okay thank you yeah. Richard did you have another question Actually, this is Dolores. I'm with Richard. Hello. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Um, we were traversing from Sucker Creek to, um, I think it was Jordan Valley. We needed fuel at the time. And on some of the roads, it was sort of not really evident whether it was private or public. And we had Gaia and we had paper maps. But anytime we saw a ranch gate, we made sure we would open it. And usually there was a sign there that said, please close, you know, the gate. And so then you knew that it was okay to go through that particular area. The funniest one, though, was there was a family that was out um, just visiting with relatives, I guess it was because this was on the weekend, and they just sort of waved us through. I mean, we went through the chickens scattered. Uh, so you can pretty well tell when it's okay to travel private land because typically there'll be a sign at the ranch gate and if you don't see a sign you don't want to do that yeah another good rule of thumb is if it says no trespassing don't trespass <laughs> yeah all right any last questions comments Yeah, thank you, Troy, not a problem. Glad you enjoyed. Well, thanks everyone for coming and thank you again, Renee, for joining us and telling us about your adventures. Um, it's been super cool. So yeah, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and then I'll get this posted on YouTube um, and send out an email to everyone. Again, thanks all for coming. Thank you for coming, everyone.